going to be something of a come down. We're now back to uh, very basic uh, things, the application of uh, uh, Cartesian mechanics to uh, the mechanics of uh, surfaces in contact. I'm going to talk a little about the Hertz theory uh, and a little bit about plastic information. Uh, for those of you who this is old fact, and that must be quite a large proportion of the audience, uh, this would be a very nice time to go to the swimming pool, and I certainly can't mind if you slip out now. Uh, it's, uh, I'm not too sure just how fast I should go. Um, I've got about an hour, an hour and a quarter. I'll try and cover the material in that time. Uh, if there are those who uh, want to go through the details a bit more carefully and ask uh, questions about how line three follows from line two, uh, there's to be a tutorial session this afternoon which I'll be present uh, and to answer those sorts of questions. Uh, the, uh, the notes are in front of you, which I'm going to go through, so everything that I, most of what I say is actually written down uh, uh, on the uh, notes which have been handed out. And the references against the headings, uh, CM page so and so, uh, refers uh, to the book in which there are rather more mistakes than uh, uh, the other was trying to suggest. Uh, right, well, uh, if we're talking about solid surfaces uh, in contact, the first distinction to make uh, is between uh, surfaces we describe as conforming, that is, they fit together before they touch, and those that we describe as non conforming. Uh, two flat, nominally flat surfaces in contact, we would say there's a conforming contact, also a general bearing. You can see this is a transparency prepared for my engineering lectures. Uh, and a non conforming contact would be a wheel on the rail or a pair of wheel of gear teeth. But if one looks at the conforming contact in more detail and recognize the inevitable roughness of their surfaces, then in fact, uh, nominally conforming contacts are in fact uh, uh, really the detail of a more microscopically uh, better described as non conforming. And most of contact mechanics, as dealt with in this morning's talk and uh, in my book, um, are uh, concerned really with uh, the local or concentrated or non conforming contacts. Right, now to the uh, analysis of such contacts. Uh, we start uh, by uh, considering. Uh, contacts which are smooth and rounded, as did Hertz. Uh, this isn't a very nice uh, three-dimensional sketch, but it's meant to indicate a, a, a curved surface of general curvature, uh, which can be expressed in terms of principal radii of curvature. And then on top of that is a similar surface uh, with two other principal radii of curvature. So there are four geometric parameters which define the contact. We choose the point where they touch is the origin of a coordinate system uh, with the common normal for z axis, the tangent plane, the xy plane. And then if one looks at two points, one above the other, uh, A, uh, A1 and A2, and uh, obtains an expression uh, for the uh, distance between the separation age in terms of the location of the point uh, in the xy plane. Uh, but it turns out uh, that uh, the expression for that displacement is of the form shown uh, in equation one. Uh, there's a constant here, which is the relative curvature of the surfaces in the x direction, the relative curvature of the surfaces in the y direction. And if we uh, ask ourselves what are the shape of contours of constant separation, uh, uh, lines, joining points which are equal distant from the two surfaces, uh, then it's easy to see uh, that that is the equation to an ellipse. So that contours of constant separation uh, are elliptical. And here is some uh, interference fringes uh, uh, showing uh, the contours of uh, constant separation. I think those are between two cylindrical con contacts, uh, two cylindrical lenses, uh, that's an inclined contact. 
Uh, but nevertheless, uh, they demonstrate this point uh, that uh, whatever the actual curvature of the solids, uh, these points of uh, equal separation are elliptical. And therefore, it's perhaps not too surprising uh, that when we press the two solids together uh, so that uh, they uh, touch not just at the uh, origin of the coordinates at the centre of the ellipse, uh, but actually make a finite contact area, uh, then it's perhaps not surprising that that is elliptical. And here are the uh, uh, interference fringes of those two lenses uh, pressed into contact. Uh, when we uh, look now at the geometry of the deformed surfaces, this is the picture that you see. Uh, the, these uh, two curved surfaces uh, originally had the profiles uh, shown dotted in this picture. They're now pressed into contact over an area which we expect to be elliptical in shape. Uh, with linear dimensions uh, uh, A and A. And uh, uh, what has happened is that the two points A1 and A2, uh, which were uh, separated, have now come together. And so one surface has been uh, compressed by a small distance W1, and the other surface uh, by a distance uh, W2. And if we now express the distance between the two surfaces the uh, <coughs> separation when the two solids are deformed and the separation before they're deformed minus the amount by which you push the two solids together uh, delta 1 and delta 2 plus the amount by which the two solids have deformed W1 and W2 and if the uh, uh, those two points now lie within the contact area, then H prime, the new separation is zero, and that gives us a relationship between the sum of the two elastic compressions and the uh, geometry of the two surfaces expressed in terms of their relative curvatures, R prime and R double prime. If those two points are still outside the contact <coughs> area, then the uh, elastic compression must be greater than delta minus x over 2r prime and one, uh, 1 squared over 2r double prime. So here we have geometric relationships uh, if, uh, which control the elastic displacements uh, of uh, corresponding points uh, on two surfaces on the surfaces of two bodies uh, which are uh, deformed uh, when pressed into contact. And that, uh, as it were, poses uh, the contact problem. Uh, what uh, pressures are required uh, to, pre uh, to uh, produce uh, elastic displacements which satisfy this relationship? Uh, if we press the bodies together with a known force, uh, what will be the uh, size of the contact area, uh, the, uh, the shape of the, uh, this expected ellipse of contact, uh, and uh, what will be the uh, uh, contact pressures and hence contact stresses within the solids. And as I'm sure you all know, this problem was uh, solved by Heinrich Hertz of uh, electromagnetic wave and fame. Uh, in, uh, uh, when he was a young research assistant to Helmholtz, age about 23, I think, uh, in the University of Berlin. Uh, he was studying uh, Newton's rings with um, glass lenses. In fact, he was doing the experiment which I demonstrated to you a few moments ago. Uh, so it was perhaps uh, not surprising uh, that he uh, realized that the contact area was going to be electrical. Uh, in his classical paper, he went through the bit of geometry which I have just done. And then he posed the question, uh, what will be the pressure distribution acting on an ellipse? Uh, which will produce elastic de de deformation uh, satisfying uh, my equation 3. And he solved the problem uh, because he knew, uh, he knew a bit about elasticity, but he knew even more about electrostatics. Uh, and he recognized that um, an 
uh, analogy, mathematical analogy, uh, between uh, the electrostatic potential uh, and uh, uh, elastic deformation, which will become more apparent uh, in a minute. Uh, if I'm allowed to digress just a moment, uh, in sort of uh, historical chit chat, uh, he, was, uh, he was very pleased with. Uh, uh, this result and found that it fitted what he observed rather nicely and he wrote uh, uh, the paper which eventually came out and uh, bore his name uh, and uh, he sent it to uh, the mathematical journal uh, which was edited by Kronika, the Kronika Delta and, and uh, as the, the experiences in those days are very similar to what we're all used to nothing happened for a long, long time so he went to Kronika and said, uh, what's happened to my paper? And he said, well, he sent it to Kirchhoff, to a referee. Uh, but uh, there was no objection if he really was worried. He was going and knocking on Kirchhoff's door and saying, what about my paper? Uh, which he did. Uh, and Kirchhoff said, very interesting paper, uh, but I found a mistake in it. And uh, uh, Kirchhoff wrote to his family and said, uh, at first, I was uh, very honored that someone at Kirchhoff's uh, uh, eminence was actually reviewing my paper and was, seemed so pleased with it. But after a while, I began to realize that he was talking about his Kirchhoff's uh, theory of contact, uh, which is in fact uh, just uh, uh, correcting this alleged mistake. Uh, and uh, as Hedd said, uh, it was left to that it became increasingly irritated uh, by Kirchhoff taking over. Uh, his work. It turned out that Kurtz was right and Kirchhoff was wrong, and, uh, uh, and that's why we don't uh, see Kirchhoff's name on the paper. Uh, well, we now have a, an area of contact, and over that elliptical area, uh, there are exerted uh, pressures normal to the surface, which must integrate up. Uh, to the normal load. Uh, in real life, we have frictional stresses, uh, Qx and Qy, uh, which must integrate up to frictional forces, uh, uh, capital Qx and Y, parallel to the uh, x and y axes. And uh, if these uh, pressures uh, and frictions are not symmetrically uh, disposed, uh, then one uh, actually uh, sums up to moments, uh, the rolling moments are moments about the x and y axes, uh, these are rolling friction moments. They're generally very small because they, uh, they rise from the asymmetry of the pressure distribution and uh, uh, are very often negligible from an engineering point of view, but these represent the resistance to rolling. And then uh, there is also a moment of the frictional stress about the normal axis, which is known as the spin moment, and that is the, uh, uh, what does the damage when you go around the corner too fast in the car and twist the contact area of your tire uh, on the road. And so, uh, the, the, again, the problem in contact mechanics is to be able to assess uh, these forces and moments in terms of the frictional behavior uh, at the interface. Right, now let's set the scene uh, for the, uh, uh, the problem which Hertz solved. And the problem which he actually solved was fairly restricted. Uh, first of all, he uh, used the small strain theory of elasticity, and it's really only in the last year or two that anyone has seriously tried to extend contact mechanics uh, to large strains uh, by using finite elements. The surfaces are continuous and smooth, no sharp corners, otherwise the geometry we've just done wouldn't work. And then uh, the approximation which was the touch of Hertz genius. Um, the surfaces are curved and they led to the geometric relationship that we uh, uh, had on the screen a moment ago. Uh, but uh, uh, what he realized was that uh, contact stresses are a very local stress concentration 
and that as far as the elastic deformation of the sides are concerned, uh, the shape of the bodies at some distance away from the contact area are not going to influence the stresses at all. And therefore, we can get a very close approximation uh, to the stress distribution uh, by uh, ignoring the curvature uh, as far as calculating the elastic deformation is concerned. So you can then replace each solid uh, by an elastic half space. Uh, and uh, was able to uh, use results which had already been developed by Cousinesse. In fact, to a sense, people say, why had Cousinesse solved the contact problem uh, some decades or so before? But it was because he didn't make this uh, jump this, uh, in, in order to see that those results which uh, he Cousinesse had derived could be used uh, to solve the problem of two uh, curved surfaces. And that, uh, 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 that uh, requires, of course, that the size of the bodies must be large compared with the size of the contact area. And finally, uh, it helps only solve the problem of frictionless contact. Uh, the effect of friction became much more significant uh, uh, in this century. Now, to the method of solution, uh, the starting point, at least as far as most of us are concerned, Age, uh, is a single point force uh, on the surface of an elastic solid, that is the, uh, what my pencil point is producing on this table. Uh, that is a standard uh, result of any elasticity book, and it shows that the uh, deformation at a distance r from the force is uh, inversely proportional to the distance. And in a sense, uh, that, uh, so we have uh, displacement proportion, inverse proportion to R. <coughs> and that, of course, is the law of ele electrostatic potential. And that was why uh, uh, Hertz was able to recognize that the displacement produced by a distributed force, or pressure, uh, uh, would be the same as those, uh, the potential due to a distributed charge on the surface of an elastic conductor. So that's the mathematical analogy uh, which uh, gave Hertz the clue uh, to uh, the answer. So now we re uh, add, uh, replace the single point force by a distribution of pressure uh, over this area which we suspect is going to be elliptical. Uh, a small element of uh, pressure gives the distribution of pressure acting on the solid. The small element of that pressure is like a concentrated force acting at point B. And we then ask what is the displacement uh, at point A? Well, it's inversely proportional to the uh, distance of uh, R of A from B and proportional <coughs> to the magnitude of that element of pressure. So here is the force slightly theta. Uh, under the square root we have the distance AB and then we sum this up over the whole of that contact area and that gives us uh, an expression for the displacement of A. Uh, now we started with the geometric relationship uh, that uh, the, dis the sum of the displacements of the two contracting bodies at that point uh, must be of this form. That is, they must vary in a parabolic way uh, with x and y, and we can now replace, uh, we can now uh, substitute for w1 and w2 uh, from this expression for w. Uh, the pressure must be on each body must be equal and opposite, so we have the uh, mutual contact pressure uh, and the uh, displacement in the ratio of the uh, plane strain moduli, 1 minus Poisson's ratio squared divided by Jones moduli. And uh, uh, that is the uh, relationship uh, which determines <coughs> the distribution of pressure uh, on this area. It's an integral equation for the pressure distribution. And it was here that Hertz uh, said, well, I know that uh, uh, an elliptical uh, distribution of charge uh, on an ellipsoidal uh, uh, distribution of charge on an elliptical area of a conductor uh, produces a potential uh, which is parabolic in form, satisfying this relationship. And therefore, by analogy, an ellipsoidal distribution of pressure uh, acting on an elliptical area uh, will also satisfy that uh, 
mighty. So he didn't solve the integral equation as a mathematician would. He solved it as a physicist would, which was to see that somebody else had worked it out before for an analogous problem, and which uh, it supports some comments that we were hearing from David Taylor uh, a few moments ago. And just to illustrate uh, what that pressure looks like, although I'm sure most of you know, is that uh, if we have an elliptical contact area, uh, the pressure distribution is half an ellipsoid uh, acting on that uh, contact area with a maximum pressure uh, P0. Uh, in a, a, the extreme uh, case where we have uh, two cylinders in contact with their axes parallel, uh, that uh, what uh, engineers tend to call a line contact, and then the, the ellipse is stretched out so that one axis uh, becomes infinitely long. And the contact area there is the uh, rather limiting case and an ellipse uh, with uh, infinite eccentricity. Uh, the contact area there, of course, is rectangular uh, with a pressure distribution which is uh, ellipsoidal in one direction and uniform in the other. So those are the two uh, extreme cases. Uh, well, uh, uh, those are the first steps. The next steps um, are relatively straightforward and a bit algebraic. Uh, I don't want to waste a lot of time on the algebra you have it in front of you, but just to um, quickly uh, outline uh, the next steps. If we take uh, the case of a, a circular contact and the lengths of equal axes, uh, where the relative curvatures r prime and r prime are equal, uh, so that the semi-axes of the ellipse a and b are equal, then the pressure distribution uh, becomes uh, hemispherical, uh, with the maximum pressure p naught and varying with the radius according to that expression. Uh, then uh, the integral in that case uh, is uh, rather straightforward. Uh, it's a standard integral, then you put that into the integral equation. And again, that gives us a displacement uh, which varies in this way uh, with radius. And then uh, substituting into the basic integral equation uh, for the contact which we developed, that is that uh, this these displacements here must satisfy the geometric condition of the delta minus r squared of the two r. Then, if that's going to be identically true, the coefficient of a uh, uh, must equal delta, and the coefficient of r squared must equal one over two r. And that gives us delta and a in terms of p naught and the elastic constants of the material. Uh, if we do a bit of shorthand and say the relative uh, radius, the, the relative curvature is the sum of the uh, two curvatures and uh, use E star as a combined elastic modulus, uh, then, uh, and then uh, recognize that the total uh, compressive load, P, is the integral of the pressure distribution over that circular contact area. Uh, and combine that bit of algebra, then we get the answers to the contact problem. The radius of the contact circle in terms of the compressive load, uh, the radius of the bodies, and the elastic, combined elastic modulus of the two materials, the amount the two bodies are compressed, and the maximum contact pressure. Uh, it often surprises people that you know, they say, why well, this? Uh, uh, Cube root coming into these relationships. Uh, one is normally expecting in an elastic problem uh, that deflections are proportional to load. Uh, here we have a situation where deflections are proportional to the cube root of the load. Uh, uh, well, that's not surprising when you uh, think what happens. In the normal linear elastic loading problem, there is no change in the area over which the loads are applied. Here, as you uh, bring the two surfaces together. Initially, they touch on a very small area, so they're very compliant, and they deform easily. Uh, as the area of contact uh, increases, the compliance decreases, the stiffness increases, so that uh, they behave like a stiffening spring, uh, giving a deflection uh, which is uh, normally with load, and the stress which is not 
And then if you do the same thing for uh, line contacts, you get a comparable uh, set of relationships for the uh, uh, width of the contact area and the maximum contact pressure. Uh, on passant, uh, to a, 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 in, when we talked about the uh, circular point contact, uh, we had an expression for the amount of the uh, two bodies uh, compress. And uh, people, engineers, wanted to find out about how much uh, gear to compress, uh, which are in line contact. Uh, uh, puzzled to find that uh, that uh, expression for the uh, compression of the two surfaces uh, does not appear in the usual uh, uh, books of Hertz formulae um, uh, for the case of line contact. And uh, uh, there are good reasons for that. Uh, they, uh, in the limit case, uh, the actual amount that the bodies uh, compress uh, depends not only on the load of the information, <coughs> uh, but also on the far field of the information. And there is no closed form expression. You can uh, imagine uh, that as you uh, increase the size of the body, so uh, the length of the line of contact increases. So that there isn't a finite load applied to the line of contact. The longer you take the line, the uh, more the load, then uh, and so on the reflection. Uh, it's uh, one of those little quirks of two dimensional theory uh, which crops up in electrostatics and electromagnetics as well. Uh, that uh, the local deformation in the case of the line contact is no longer local. Uh, what I've put here is an approximation uh, for the Hertz uh, formulae for elliptical contacts, uh, which I think, uh, uh, well, uh, my attention was drawn to it by my colleague Jim Greenwood. Uh, it's a very good approximation for uh, ellipses which. Uh, not perfect eccentricity greater than about five. Uh, and what it does in effect is uh, get um, a, an effective radius of uh, contact, uh, which is the geometric mean of the two radii, uh, R prime and R double prime, the two relative radii of curvature, and then uses the circular contact uh, formula uh, with R prime. It's, um, it's in my book, but it's, uh, it's a very quick way of getting answers without getting these uh, transcendental equations with the elliptical integrals in them. Well, that's the, uh, those are the steps that Hertz took. And what he found, uh, as we've seen, is the shape and size of the contact ellipse given the load. Uh, he found the distribution of surface pressure and its maximum value P0, and in the case of a point contact, uh, the compression. Um, he didn't really take the problem any further, uh, but uh, if one is a trimologist and is, is concerned with surface distress in one of its forms, uh, uh, wear, uh, or fatigue, uh, or plastic deformation, uh, then one needs to go uh, dig a bit deeper. Uh, one needs to know what are the stresses produced within the solid themselves, both at the surface and beneath the surface, uh, by those contact pressures. Uh, and uh, those were steps that were taken uh, in the years that followed Hertz's paper. <coughs> so, uh, the next little bit of mechanics uh, concerns the stresses in the solid. And I'm going to take the line contact of cylinders uh, uh, because this is a, perhaps a, a simpler case uh, for the purposes of um, exposition. Uh, the, the problem can be solved in many ways, the further you are in mathematics, the further away you can think of. Uh, nowadays, of course, we really think of most unclever ways uh, because now we have uh, but uh, the uh, basic way, uh, I hope I'm not sort of uh, talking down to say these things, but uh, the basic way is 
go back to this uh, fundamental problem and uh, elasticity, um, I've not listed what the stresses are at an internal point in the solid due to that kind of force, uh, but they're uh, relatively simple expressions, uh, which as I say, in any textbook uh, in elasticity. And then just as we uh, superpose the point forces to get a distributed pressure, and so uh, in elasticity uh, we can superpose the stresses to find, uh, superpose those point forces to find the stresses at any point subsurface. So, uh, uh, although I'm not going to do anything about that, uh, uh, what is involved, what goes on behind the scenes, is not all that subtle. And, it, uh, and we're going to look at the uh, stress components uh, for line contact, so that's the plane strain uh, situation, at different depths below the surface. The first point to note uh, is that the stresses everywhere in the solid are compressive. And uh, in a sense, that's one of the problems of trimology. Uh, that, uh, <coughs> Contact stresses are compressive. Um, we know that uh, uh, where particles are produced, and that means that uh, fracture in some form must take place uh, to finish up with separate pieces of material. Uh, but most of our understanding about the mechanism of fracture is in terms of tension. And you're very hard pressed in a uh, contact situation uh, to find tensile stresses uh, of uh, any magnitude. So, uh, returning to this figure, uh, the stress acting normal to the surface, uh, that is resisting the pressure on the surface, uh, sigma uh, ZZ, uh, normalized with respect to the maximum pressure, uh, decays as you go to the solid, as you would expect from the stress concentration, but it decays rather slowly. Uh, the stress acting parallel to the surface, Uh, 
shapes of ellipse. Uh, a line of contact has a ratio of uh, semi-axes of the ellipse, A to B to zero, and the circular contact uh, has a ratio of one, and uh, here we have uh, different uh, eccentricities of the ellipse. But, but if you uh, look at the values of the maximum shear stress as a function of the as a ratio of the maximum pressure, but the variation is really rather small. So that changing the shape of the contact does not change very much uh, that maximum shear stress beneath the surface, uh, which we expect to be the source of uh, or the origin of plastic information. How will the coverage of the atmospheric uh, pressure be? Uh, yes, I, I did have a slide that, uh, yeah, that showed that. Uh, I haven't got it with me, but uh, they, they look something like this. Uh, well, of course, underneath the one at the surface uh, is just a reflection of the uh, pressure distribution, and then they go something like this. And uh, of course, uh, so that one has the, the, the maximum stress of any value uh, is at this point here and is equal to P naught. And then you have a uh, you know, hydrostatic pressure field which is decaying, decaying well. But even uh, down here, uh, where you're getting shear damage and plastic flow, you still have a superimposed hydrostatic pressure. Uh, and that again uh, gives uh, uh, intellectual problems uh, in understanding failure because uh, uh, even if one does initiate a crack through flaws in the material, there is still this hydrostatic pressure forcing the faces of the crack together. Uh, and uh, uh, there are real uh, problems in trying to understand the way in which uh, cracks are propagated uh, uh, within the, the contact stress field. Those are things we can discuss uh, uh, later. But now, uh, I will, I'm just going to say a few words in completion uh, about uh, what happens when we exceed the elastic limit. Uh, it is a stress concentration, uh, and therefore we would expect to move rather easily uh, from what uh, David Taylor said earlier. Uh, uh, it was almost taken for granted that at least uh, on the severity scale, uh, one was going to have uh, plastic deformation. Uh, the, uh, the point at risk where plasticity starts is that uh, below the surface, uh, where the shear stresses are high. And uh, if we know the elastic stress field, and we have a criterion yield, uh, then we can uh, calculate the contact pressure and hence load at which you will first start. Uh, a yield criteria uh, must be expressed in terms uh, of the three principal stresses, and if we have an isotropic and homogeneous material, it must be uh, invariant uh, as to the axes you choose. Uh, and there are various possibilities. Uh, experiment tells us uh, that uh, at least under reasonable pressures, uh, materials do not respond plastically to hydrostatic pressure, uh, so that uh, the yield must be governed by deviatoric or shear stresses. And the two common ones, uh, the long means uh, criterion uh, in terms of uh, all three principal stresses, the looping square, or the Tresca uh, criterion in terms of the maximum which is stress existing in the material. The point about those two uh, yield criteria, uh, which I uh, throw in, is that uh, uh, the difference between them is not very large. It's never more than 50%. <coughs> uh, uh, they apply only for isotropic materials, and no material materials are isotropic for long after you start performing them. And therefore, in a sense, which you choose depends on which gives you the easiest mathematics uh, rather than uh, too much fret about which is more correct. And then if one applies uh, those uh, uh, yield criteria to the uh, stresses beneath and uh, uh, contact, and uh, uses the uh, stress distributions which we just derived, 
then we can get expressions for the uh, maximum pressure P0 at the given point, uh, which I denoted by P0 suffix Y, in terms of either the yield stress in simple shear K or the yield stress in tension uh, denoted by capital Y. And you'll see that the differences between the two uh, uh, in criteria are not uh, great, uh, either for uh, a line contact or for a circular pump contact. But what I've done in this last expression here is to obtain, uh, the, uh, use the Hertz formula to get an expression for the load, which will uh, just produce yielding at that critical point beneath the surface. Uh, you'll notice it's proportional to the uh, square of the radius, uh, the cube of the yield stress, and inversely proportional to the combined elastic modeling of the two materials. And um, uh, I think it's just worth pausing and looking at that expression because it tells us an awful lot about uh, the practical um, ramifications of contact mechanics. Um, first of all, if you increase uh, the radius of curvature, or relative radius of curvature of your two solids, uh, then you start putting up the load you can carry before yield, uh, actually with the square of that radius. Uh, and so that uh, uh, if you go down to smaller spellities with high curvature, small radius, uh, then uh, you're going to yield not reasonably. Uh, the, uh, the load you can carry before the yielding depends is proportional to the cube of the yield stress or the cube of the hardness. And that again is reflected in the uh, uh, fact that high hardness uh, is a, a necessary criteria for carrying large contact loads. Uh, why the bearing industry is concerned about high hardness. Uh, why protecting surfaces from uh, damage uh, when it puts uh, hard layers on the surface. If I had a, um, a half inch of, what should we say, one centimeter of steel uh, ball and a, 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 a flat surface of mild solid, a broadly soft structure of steel, I could reach the yield point with the forces that I could exert uh, with my hand uh, on that ball. Uh, but uh, uh, between mild steel and bearing steel, uh, there's a factor of uh, three about on hardness. So that's uh, 27 on uh, a factor of 27 on the load uh, that that ball will carry before uh, yielding. So that, that Q uh, is uh, very important for the engineering applications of contact stress. And again, if we make the, uh, the surfaces very elastic by bringing the elastic modulus down, that again uh, will enable uh, one to carry uh, large, uh, larger loads um, uh, with, uh, uh, without yielding. And of course, uh, if you go to polymers, uh, one can uh, uh, carry quite reasonable loads with a polymer without yielding. And if you go to rubber, uh, then one can hit a squash ball quite uh, hard without it um, acquiring a permanent change of shape. Okay. Uh, well, uh, that was uh, finding the loads at which the yield uh, uh, would first occur at that point in, uh, below the surface. Uh, we now ask ourselves what happens if we increase that load uh, so that the contact deformation spreads. Um, let's just go back to this picture. Uh, we found the <laughs> pressure or load at which we just reached the yield of this point of the surface. That, that would be, yeah, that's a, uh, that would be a good point, point actually. Uh, because the point 
So all this is to say that, that, that you really don't observe that first view at all easily uh, until the plastic zone uh, has spread uh, by a large amount, so that all this volume of material over here is plastic, and you don't get anything like a hardness indentation until uh, the plastic zone breaks out to the surface and the material can actually escape uh, from under the indenter uh, and give them uh, appreciable uh, permanent uh, deformation and indentations. Uh, so that uh, whereas <coughs> if you take a bar and pull it, uh, when one gets yield, you get quite a sharp corner to the low deflection curve. Uh, but if you apply those uh, uh, on a contact like this, uh, the change from elastic to plastic behavior is almost uh, imperceptible. Uh, well, uh, what can we say about the plastic regime? Uh, there are, I, I identify three regimes in indentation. First of all, there's the elastic regime, uh, which we've been uh, talking about, and for which we have the Hertz equations. And uh, in, uh, on this slide, I recast uh, the Hertz expressions in a slightly different form. Uh, the mean contact pressure denoted by P bar uh, is two thirds of the maximum contact pressure P naught. And uh, written it in this form, where Y is the uh, new stress of the material. And so that we have the mean contact pressure normalized by the yield stress uh, is proportional to this uh, group uh, here, which is the contact radius divided by the uh, relative radius of the sphere, for example, normalized again by the yield stress and the uh, elastic modulus. And if one uh, gets the contact area, which is pi n squared, uh, then uh, you can get a similar uh, non-dimensional expression for a non-dimensional load in terms of a non-dimensional uh, contact area. The point of doing that will be apparent immediately. Now the second regime uh, is uh, when the uh, material, uh, the plastic deformation uh, is contained uh, within the uh, solid. Uh, this is uh, more difficult to analyze, although uh, quite a lot of solutions are now coming out, numerical solutions using finite elements. Uh, for the, uh, that uh, regime of loading, where we've exceeded yield below the surface, but it's not yet uh, broken out to the surface. Some of you will be familiar uh, with a rather rough and ready model uh, that was suggested by Rodney Hill and developed by me uh, some years ago, uh, which uh, gives uh, this expression for the normalized mean pressure. Again, in terms of this non-dimensional group uh, A, E star over R times 1. And then uh, eventually when material does uh, break out to the surface, uh, one can use, uh, and the plastic strains become large compared with the elastic strains, then you can use the rigid perfect plastic slip line field type of uh, analysis uh, to find the indentation pressure uh, in terms of the yield stress. And uh, as uh, was uh, shown experimentally uh, by table uh, in the 50s, if not the 40s, and by Rodney Hill at about the same sort of time, but one then gets a P bar normalized by the yield stress is a constant uh, very nearly equal to 3. So we can uh, add the area of contact in this non dimensional terms can be expressed that way. Uh, so what we have are these three regimes. Uh, we have developed uh, relatively simple expressions uh, for the mean contact <coughs> pressure, or if you like, the indentation hardness, uh, as a function of this non-dimensional group, which involves the uh, radius of the contact, the radius of the indenter, 
the combined elastic modulus of the two materials and the yield stress. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, would any speakers like to be the first 
I think that it's a good question, but it is entirely premature. I think the essence of the, uh, the meeting is to address this particular problem. I mean, this week, I think we'll concentrate rather heavily on continuum arguments. Next week, we'll get into the microscopic arguments. And hopefully, the later part of next week, there will be at least the beginnings of a satisfactory answer to the question you posed and questions which could reasonably be derived. recently by John Ferranti 
and others where he has worked out the intrinsic uh, instability of two flat surfaces, the question of balancing adhesion and cohesion, and showing that uh, under certain conditions, below a certain separation, the, the lattice is just unstable. The only, the, so I suspect that this point about the, the calculations of instabilities when flat surfaces approach, it's, it's related to what Professor Tabor told us this morning about what must happen when surfaces separate. And the, the other thing that, that comes to mind is, is the, the, the calculations that were done quite a long time ago um, by Professor Johnson and others. If we consider what happens of contact between a sphere and a flat, where, where he did take into account um, all, all the relevant energies, the surface energy, the elastic uh, energy, and the potential energy. And I will be talking about this this evening, but for the moment, let me just say that, of course, um, there is irreversibility involved in that situation, too. Because when you touch the surfaces together at zero load, they, 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 they snap together and you get a finite contact area, and then then, in case of increase the load, the area varies continuously with the load. If you make the load negative, the load is full, and eventually um, the area, of course, gets less, and then it comes to the point when the surface is snapped apart. So, here, if you like, you have a little cycle, and you can go around that cycle if you like, and, and it, it must be irreversible. And so, we have to keep clear the, the distinction. That effect here, and the intrinsic instabilities such as uh, um, are inherent in the, in the properties of the lattice. I just want to make a, I'm Jim Brand, so I just want to make a, a credit to come in from the way you have uh, that kind of sudden that gave us the idea, and I think Chrissy Lineman is also just to be able to point to things, and we were just lucky, the lucky ones who had to get the air flow. One of the tossing the dice in physical waters. <laughs> I will comment on that. Okay, next. Some of the losing element of the Georgia that I will see. The, uh, I had the question of Vivian and uh, and uh, the comment, and it's with regard to the question of the yield criteria. So in the spirit of the school, uh, there were two, uh, two yield criteria that Professor Johnson discussed. One was the and he correctly said that uh, uh, most practical uses uh, the differences of 15 or 20 percent and estimates the gifts of numerical purposes. Dr. Lehman, no one here at the back wants to come out. Well, numerical purposes, it might not be, uh, <coughs> it might not matter really which one one uses. But I think so, from, uh, from a point of view of physical feel, the uh, von Mises criteria appeals to me more because it's based on more of an energetic uh, uh, signaling. The, if one takes the expressions that Professor Johnson provided in the, in the, uh, in the uh, notes for the for Mises uh, criteria, the left-hand side of the equation that we wrote, uh, and divides it by the shear law, because this gives you an expression for the amount of uh, energy available to perform plastic deformation. So I like more to think along that line rather than just taking the uh, difference between the maximum and minimum of the diagonal. So I think that there is, um, uh, um, it's, it's a fine point, but I think it's a fine point that is um, uh, 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 useful for those who are not used to, or for the first time look at these yield criteria, to know that there is a distinction in the way of physical motivation. And one is more based on the question of energy available to say, and the other one, as far as I can see, can be, well, it can be uh, characterized, it can be uh, described in various ways, but really it's pulled kind of out. The, the other comment has to do with the comment that uh, uh, my good friend Jacob made uh, with regard to David Taylor's suggestion. Uh, and uh, Jacob's right that, uh, that uh, surfaces do snap, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult to avoid this, uh, this, uh, this uh, catastrophic uh, fast events, uh, no matter how slow you separate the two things. 
uh, there will be a point of instability where, say, uh, two armstrands of lattice spacings will be jumped uh, in a picosecond. This will give a kind of sound wave propagating. However, however, it's not it's not necessary that the whole surface will separate as a uniform thing. It could develop these little necks, little columns. And those can, when done very slowly, those will reorganize themselves in a slow way. And eventually, it will come to the point of snapping maybe the distance between only two atoms and the amount of energies that this, do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, maybe I'll make a picture. Uh, how much time do I have? Uh, if I start from these, if I start from these two surfaces here, and uh, this is the imaginary point where they're going to, uh, going to separate them, uh, they can start to separating by uh, say this is one surface and the other one, and I will start to form these kind of little necks between them, and this will be separated here, and uh, even in reality, I mean, and here I have this thing here. Now I have this next of material between. And uh, this is a uh, vacuum here. Here's nothing in between for air that uh, you wish to have. Now I have this. And as I go further on, this will thin down to very narrow necks. And the material, if I do it very slowly, will reorganize itself in a reversible manner. And I won't have any dissipation going through to here. And now I have this. And eventually I'll come to the point that I'll magnify this thing here where I got myself really a string of atoms, if you want, or maybe two of them here, but I won't talk about that. And here we have one surface, and here we have another, and this is the whole blocks of David Tabor. And eventually I'll snap something here. And this will not throw a big, uh, big effect on, on, the, on this thing here. So, in other words, what you say, Jacob, is applicable if the whole thing, if you regard the separation here, will occur uniformly for the whole two things, but the two things will separate in that. What I'm saying, that it doesn't have to separate this way, and this will be a very adiabatic route for separating the two surfaces. It will avoid this catastrophic things and throwing the waves. So it may occur actually in the situations. Thank you. I have a question about experiment which is depicted here. You, you have two ways in principle of doing it. You can impose a displacement and attempt to measure the force, or impose a force and measure displacement. Invariably, you would be relying on a spring stiffness to sense a force through a displacement. So, this point will come up, I'm sure Professor Mogis will speak about it in terms of viscoelastic peeling later and instabilities. Mike Adams mentioned it. So you can obtain stability in a conventional experiment in this region. 
Once you come to this point here, the system is actually softening. And the natural tendency would be for it to release. This is the essence of the jump technique, which was popularized by yourself, Jacob. It would be very difficult, if not impossible, to undertake an experiment in this regime. So my, my belief is that if you could do the experiment, then you would construct this curve in a stable way. Of course, the uncertainty principle would prescribe that it would be possible for the interface to you know, fail immediately and catastrophically, but in truth, it wouldn't. So I think Professor Tabor alluded to the point that it is associated with, I don't want to use the word, a necessary artifact associated with the way that these measurements are done. There will always be elasticity in the transducers or in the subsurface regions associated with Jim Rice in 1978, where he tried to look at this great question of brittle fracture, uh, not from the point of view of the first law of thermodynamics, but from the point of view of the second law of thermodynamics. And we may want to consider a brittle material where we have a series of bonds in the sense that David Table has uh, drawn up here, something perhaps like silicon or diamond, where the bonds are very localized. And, the, and I think in the picture, that Jacob was trying to present, as we want to crack through such a system, we pop bond by bond, and therefore we, we emit sound waves. But there's also, uh, in, in most of these systems, we're doing it at room temperature or at elevated temperature, there are thermal fluctuation, fluctuations as well. And although there, are, there can be very local energy barriers to overcome as we go from one bond to the next and allow the, the next row of bonds to take up the strain of a predecessor, then uh, thermal fluctuations can help if the, if the energy barriers are not too large. And this will certainly be the case in materials like mica, where the bonds are not so strongly localized as they are in silicon and germanium and, and diamond. And, and Rice's idea was that if you disturb the system from, well, first of all, in the state of, uh, of equilibrium, you can have these bonds in a state of thermal fluctuation so that you may be able to break a bond and allow the crack to go forward one atomic spacing or, or backward one atomic space. It's a kind of a dynamic or kinetic process at the atomic level. And if you can now disturb that system from the state of equilibrium by increasing, the, by increasing the applied load, then you start to increase the rate at which you can overcome the thermal fluctuations or overcome the energy barriers, and the crack will start to move forward at a certain rate or a certain velocity. And he re-derives Griffith's condition for fracture and whereas we think of it as the as uh, g equals two gamma, where g is uh, mechanical energy release rate, kind of thing that Daniel Magis expresses in his papers, he tends to write down the, the a more fundamental equation for crack propagation in terms of g minus two gamma times the crack velocity. Perhaps I can just test that again. <coughs> says that this has to be greater or greater or equal to zero. And this is Griffith's score re-expressed in the second law of the thermodynamics, with very subtle implications as to exactly what this means. But it does mean that you can run this crack forward and keep it in a state of thermal equilibrium. Mechanical equilibrium, if we reduce the temperature to absolute zero, we have to overcome these energy bumps. And going forward and back, we have a kind of hysteresis. But in a state of uh, thermal equilibrium, and we do this as, as slowly as we please, and if the energy barriers are quite large, and this may take a long time, but in principle, at temperature greater than absolute zero, we ought to be able to come to a state of thermal equilibrium and satisfy a more general criterion of that kind. But if, if you really want to look at that, I commend you to read Rice's paper in 1978 and 1980. I would like to return on the definition of the coefficient of friction. It is usually defined as the ratio of the tangential force on the applied load 
but it is the applied load by the experimental load. And uh, it is not a good idea for our physicists because we, in this definition, we forget the load applied by the molecular forces. It is exactly as the friction of a magnet on, uh, on steel. The friction coefficient may be very high to uh, 100 or more. And uh, you have the load applied by the experimental plus the magnetic load. And it is the same thing with, the, with intermolecular forces. And uh, the friction coefficient can vary with the load. This is an example of friction coefficient on a glass ball on a rubber and uh, for various uh, of the of the glass ball. And you see that the, when the load decreases, the friction coefficient can increase until 70 years uh, or even to infinity because we have a friction coefficient we have a, a friction force under zero load, so the friction coefficient is infinite. And we have to take into account the supplementary load due to the molecular forces. And one way to do this is to use the load P1 given in the GKL theory, which gives exactly the same radius of contact. And if you define the friction coefficient by the potential force, by this apparent load, that's about that's the load, you see the red curves, the friction coefficient does not vary with the load. And this explains why the friction coefficient <coughs> is so high in good vacuum, because you have increased the molecular forces and increased the apparent load on the slider. I think I more or less said what I feel about it. <coughs> As an engineer, the, the numerical distinctions, well, I, I think I've said this, so I don't want to need to say it again, but the numerical distinctions are uh, within the extent to which one can rely on materials to be homogeneous, isotropic, and so on. But uh, uh, having said that, uh, we all, I suppose, have little feelings about it more physically realistic. And uh, uh, while uh, Langman was saying he liked the Omnesis uh, criteria because it uh, could be associated with shear strain energy, I think the association with shear strain energy is utterly a fact. If you talk to a mathematician, uh, he doesn't mention physics at all on energies. He said that uh, there are three uh, uh, invariant, invariants of the stress tensor. We throw out the first invariant because that's the mean hydrostatic pressure, which we know uh, doesn't influence yield. That leaves two more. The second one is in terms of stress squared, and it's rather simple. The third one is very complicated, and I can't remember. So we leave that out <laughs> because it's complicated. And that leaves us with the Bob Mises criteria, which they would say is mathematically uh, appealing in the way that Dr. Lagerman has said the energy criteria is physically appealing. Now I think if I uh, were to uh, express personal views along the appealing line, it would be that uh, uh, I envisage from metals plastic flow taking place by shear on crystal planes, uh, and the uh, Tresca criteria, the maximum shear resolved on a, an easy slip direction, is more physically appealing uh, than uh, something in terms of energy, which always seems to me a way of uh, hiding physics rather than revealing it. Okay, I, uh, all right, one last comment. Uh, well, I had several.
A is approximately the same as R. Have you ever tried to take the original Hertz theory, something that I did, so I don't think that's very uh, uh, how, um, uh, how would you quantify it when A is closer to R, when you don't do the trace of Hertz? Uh, well, I don't think there's an easy answer to that question. Um, the Hertz theory works, uh, provided and because of uh, the fact that in the circumstances that we've been discussing, uh, the stress zone is very local, uh, and uh, by the time you come to the boundaries of the body itself, or if it's a sphere, the radius of the sphere, uh, then uh, the stress there is, is very small. And it's, uh, it, I, I think it's rather similar to modern uh, fraction mechanics, where one can look at what happens at the uh, stress at the crack tip without uh, asking what the shape of the solid is. You can separate out the local thing from the distant thing. Now, if one starts asking the question you're asking, which is uh, when the contact area is comparable with the size of the bodies themselves, then really the Hertz theory breaks down completely. You've now got a a stress problem in which the shape and size of the, uh, of the boundaries of the body uh, have to be taken into account. And it's, uh, in a way, it's, uh, again, to make the analogy with uh, fracture, it's when the uh, uh, size of the plastic zone around the crack tip now becomes comparable with the size of the solid. The really elastic fracture mechanics no longer applies. So you have to start again with a problem on the elasticity. Well, this is getting too, too long. Uh, let's do that this, this afternoon. Um, I do want to break the session now. Dr. Cable, like a few words. I felt that because uh, when I talk I gave was a bit interrupted, uh, one of the final points I was trying to make, uh, I will now make. Um, when I talked about Fusion uh, in terms of surface energy, and I'm talking about surface separation this way. And I was trying to argue that maybe this is a perfectly, uh, this is a, 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 an ideal system in which all that is done is to create a new surface and that the elastic energy in the hinterland uh, is restored uh, and no energy is lost. Of course, uh, if the elasticity is supplied by the uh, spring system that is supporting the body, then of course there's a lot of other elastic energy available, and I think this may account for the instability that Jacob described. I may be wrong, that's my impression, but if, as it were, there were solid surfaces in Pullman Park, that would be, there would be no elastic energy lost in that system. Maybe wrong, I don't know. But the real point I wanted to make is the distinction between pulling surfaces apart in this way and shearing. Because it seemed to me that when you're sliding one surface over the other, you're down, bound to get instabilities in the forces between the atoms and bound to get kicking back and dissipation of energy. And that really ends the point I was trying to make that in friction, dissipation is really due to a shear which distorts the uh, structure and these things flick back from an unstable position and release the vibrations of energy. That's heat. We have some announcements to end the session from the action. These announcements, I'm oh, sorry, these announcements are well, it's, uh, it's uh, to, in some way, to uh, complement and supplement uh, the uh, full program of uh, this morning. And um, I will keep uh, details to uh, to uh, the talks that uh, that I will give uh, sometime next week, uh, where um, more of the uh, integrated things will be discussed in some more details and things. And also the late hour is such that perhaps a uh, more um, uh, easier talk is called for. So I will try not to. Uh, not to involve you with too many details, although there will be many topics that I'll try to touch on.
And let me say first a uh, somewhat of a confession that I'm uh, a theoretical physicist who was trained in, uh, in, uh, in field theory and uh, things of that nature. And uh, it was not without any, uh, without uh, somewhat of a hesitation that they started uh, doing work in, uh, in uh, equation uh, and, and questions of uh, mutational systems in uh, mechanical contact. Uh, most of my friends in the physics community would call that this, uh, Schmutz physics. And, uh, but I think that this was um, due to uh, the, uh, because of the uh, very fine people that I had the opportunity to work with, uh, some uh, theorists, uh, David Lutke, who is here with my group, and uh, other people in my group, uh, still experimentalists, uh, with Nancy Bernhardt and Rich Colton, and uh, very good probing uh, questions by Pollock. Many people in this audience. Uh, so uh, it became a very rewarding and very uh, interesting experience, and that's uh, some of it I would like to uh, share with you in the spirit of uh, sharing the paper. So uh, the issue that is of, uh, of, uh, of interest to us is the question of micro. This was done before we realized that it should be called nano mechanics and on biology on the atomic scale. Now today I will devote mostly to illustrate simply to you what can be learned from computer simulations. How you learn that and how it's done, this is uh, for next week. And this is the range of issues uh, that, uh, that arise here. Most things that I, many of them you are familiar, they are advertisements for grounding agencies and also very good scientific issues that are on right. Uh, what is uh, uh, important is uh, this uh, point here, which I hope to benefit the most personally out of this meeting, namely the coming together of continuum mechanics and microscopic approaches, and the questions of the relationship, the validity of continuum based theory, or perhaps the modifications that are needed in order to go. After all, after you see what the type of works that I'm uh, in, uh, involved with, um, it's not the type of things that you want to do for every system that you come across uh, uh, in, in nature. Uh, it's costly, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's um, you say that it's not clever. Uh, so I'll show you that it's, uh, it's uh, it, I, I, I rather say that it's not elegant, but I also like the saying by Einstein that elegance should be left for the tables. Uh, in any case, what I will tell you about is uh, uh, about molecular dynamic simulations. And uh, in a, in a, in a, in a, to a large extent, molecular dynamic simulations are experiments. So I'm, uh, I'm uh, in some way an experimentalist in this, uh, in this area. And it's computer-based experiments. Uh, for those of you who, uh, who are not used to, to the term uh, simulations, I have... Uh, uh, is there a way to turn it on? So I went to the dictionary and got the uh, Oxford Dictionary uh, a definition of simulations, so that you can see it's to feign, pretend, have the feel where the guys act the part come to fit. So uh, it also comes close to the word simplification. And in many ways, it is a simplification because it's an exact solution, brute force, it may be, of, uh, uh, <laughs> of uh, many degrees of freedom. And that's uh, really where we want to use molecular dynamics uh, or, or computer based uh, simulation methods when you want to deal with systems which have many degrees of freedom, complex interactions, including non-linearities. And uh, particularly when there's no symmetry arguments that uh, allow you to do analytical theory for this. And these are the systems that we're dealing with. Uh, besides, it uh, provides us with the ability to, uh, uh, to uh, obtain information on very refined, very high resolution in space and time. Sometimes not available even under uh, experimental resolution. So we can gain information on a much finer scale. You can do uh, uh, experiments like that, commercial experiments, in extreme conditions like high pressures, high loads, 
uh, high temperatures, high fluxes, in the case that we're simulating, for example, currents in, in semiconductors and so Now, most importantly for me here is the testing ground for theoretical ideas, because we have full control. I mean, you can play with nature as you wish. You can change potentials, you can modify potentials, you can eliminate certain type of interactions. So you are in control of this thing. You are not at the mercy of an experimentalist who does not have enough cleanliness in his sample. Our computers are very clean and very air conditioned and temperature controlled. Now, the uh, role of that is not only as a testing ground for, for, uh, for uh, 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 theoretical ideas, but you can also uh, obtain data that sometimes is otherwise not available. Um, very important, and it's a psychological, but it's psychological and uh, it's not metaphysical, it's actually something that integrates into you, is the fact that by doing simulations you become aware of certain events, certain processes, certain uh, uh, physical realities that happen, they make you think in a certain way, and that's what I hope this video will demonstrate to you, that by using a modern visualization methods, now this uh, I will not uh, talk about today. There's a lot of issues having to do with the question of how big of a system can you think of for how long of a time. And these are issues that are related to advances in computer architecture, the method of power and distributed storage and the like. This will be the subject of the workshops that we'll run here on Thursday with the uh, other experts and the audience for participating and contributing to this. So as I said, this is uh, an experimental science. Not knowing how to do things in the real life, you do it in the computer, and that's the laboratory. And uh, the um, uh, method is, in principle, uh, 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 very simple, uh, clever and simple. Uh, although, the, as I said, it's a uh, brute force way. <laughs> you have uh, MA is equal to F. And notice that it's very last for the discussion here, so I keep it here. By the way, you can do also fun with what I'll talk about, MA equal to F, F, but the F is equal simply to the acceleration is the second derivative of the position of particle I, and the force is minus the gradient of the potential interaction between all these particles. And uh, then you just ask the computer to uh, integrate these many coupled uh, differential equations and to follow the phase space trajectory. It's called phase space trajectory meaning to follow the position and momentum of each particle as a function of time. If you're in equilibrium, you of course can average over extended periods of time and get equilibrium properties, including fluctuations in the light. If you want to study a system that is out of equilibrium, how it goes into equilibrium, just follow the trajectory <coughs> and properties which are derived from that, such as, uh, for example, uh, the stress distributions or any other things that you wish to do. So this is the method, integration of equation of motion, and uh, you can do uh, various things with it. As I say, you can do also quantum mechanical calculations, which we will not discuss. And it's very important uh, what you put into these calculations. And um, of course, what you have to put is interaction potentials. Again, I will not say much about the interaction potentials, except to tell you that unless you want to uh, live in the world of Ben and John's you, you have to uh, become specific about the materials that you're dealing with. Now, of course, we don't want to cover all the various um, uh, combinations and uh, permutations in the periodic table, but we can classify things according to the following way. Pair potentials, for example, which depend on the relative distance between uh, particles. Uh, phi 2 for pair, Rij distance between particles I and J. Example, Leonard Jones potentials. This is good for uh, as generic studies. This will be good a lot to physical mechanics, fluids, and the like. It's uh, also very good for rare gases, but I doubt that many of you are interested in the equation for rare gases. Although there are beautiful experiments that, uh, that, uh, that uh, have been done with the microbiome that can prove that it is for fundamental uh, science points. <coughs> now, ionic materials, you uh, have other potentials. You have Coulomb contributions, you have charges, you have Born Meyer repulsion, and of course, start to overlap, you have dispersion, and so the like. Now, for the purpose of my talk today, I will not talk about three body terms here. This will be next week. This is to be covalency. Things that have to do angle dependence to them, hybridization of electron orbitals. But what's important for us is matters. And what is very important for all of you to know, and many of you are sure do know that, in case that you do, then you will agree with me, those who do not know should know, that metals cannot be described properly by pair potentials. And the reason is 
that the uh, major contribution to the cohesive energy of the metal comes from what's called the volume energy. This has to do with the density of conduction electrons in which the ion cores are embedded. So sodium, for example, is sodium plus embedded into the uh, environment with the proper density of electron gas and about, uh, say, 85% uh, of the cohesive, cohesive energy of sodium has nothing to do with any other neighbor, just the very fact that it's electron gas. And for that, we use what's called the embedded atom method, the other complete method, this uh, seems to be the most convenient one, which is a many body term here where the density around atom I derives contributions <coughs> from all the atomic density, the A here, from all the neighbors J not equal to I. The neighbors can be very far away because there's a many body potential supplemented by core core which are there. So it's complex potentials that one has to use. Now I will not go over all the case studies that we have been involved in, so I can distribute with you uh, the uh, <coughs> information about that. Um, we started back in 88 with the studies of the question of finite deformations and shear strain and glide. And this I will not talk about today. Uh, we um, also studied the question of silicon tips on silicon surfaces. And perhaps uh, we'll have an opportunity to talk about that today. Uh, here, there's a nice example there, there to um, um, certain things that Professor Hagel mentioned this morning, where the atomic scale takes slip when one takes a very sharp silicon tip simulates in the computer and translates the tip with regard to the surface, what one finds is that the covalently bonded atom at the bottom of the tip does stay bonded while the stage on which it is related to is moving and then it snaps. It does that. And as a matter of fact, you can even measure by the knowing the kinetic energy, mv squared, divided by two to three half kt, to equate that to the temperature jumps. And I'll show you that too in the question. So uh, this is silicon, but silicon is not what the uh, what uh, we're going to talk about today. What we will talk about mostly will be about the uh, metal against metal, the question of contact formation. And if you wish to read about some of these studies, uh, this is uh, one paper that was published in 1990, another one in 1991, and another one was uh, about in the 150th issue of Ware, uh, edited by, uh, <coughs> by Dawson. Now, in addition to, uh, to the question of nickel tips against gold and gold against nickel, cases very asymmetric situation in the question of hysteresis in the forces and the jump to contact. I would like also to bring something that uh, uh, I haven't shown before because I didn't have this material before. Just to tell the, uh, the, uh, uh, to, uh, the morning of uh, leaving uh, the States. And this is a nickel tip and alkane hexadecane film between and uh, a gold substrate. And the question that we ask here will an alkane stop the formation of jump to and that's uh, an interesting question, and I will uh, uh, try to bring <coughs> some results for it. Also, uh, I may uh, mention also other um, uh, uh, interesting results that if I don't get to that, let me say it right ahead. And if you want some proof to that, ask me a question. And this is the question of two ionic materials found against alcohol. Calcium chloride, tip, very large, passive tip, exposing the face against the calcium chloride substance. Shear from with respect to the other. And what one finds um, of great interest there is that um, there's a very interesting effect having to do with the fact coupling to the um, uh, super ionic conductivity of calcium chloride. Turns out that calcium fluoride and it, at some high temperature, the bulk of calcium chloride at about 1450 degrees Kelvin, uh, starts to super ionic conduct. The fluorides move from their sun lattice and become liquid. Well, the calcium maintains its positions in the lens. Now, we have studied surface superionic conductivity, namely heating up the, the crystal and bringing up, bring it up to about 1100 degrees, about 300 degrees below the bulk, and it defluorides up to run like mad, it becomes liquid, it becomes superionic conducting at the first three or four layers in the surface. Now, if you now start to move from the tip against the thing, what happens is that you actually see that it relatively Low temperature in this business of calcium chloride, about uh, 900 or 700 degrees Kelvin, you start to see an effect in which the resistance, the friction coefficient, goes down because the fluoride lubricates. It becomes a superionic conductor. So it's a very nice example of something that you mentioned that in, in, in memory, how 
here's a phase transition. It's an interesting way that a physical phenomena of totally different regime coupled to biology, namely superhuman connectivity and the questions of, uh, of uh, the, the very known anomalies, by the way, in the fluoride system with regard to the uh, yield stress. Uh, 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 uh. Now, so this is uh, just by way of introduction, but let me turn more into the heart of the matter. And, um, and um, I will um, uh, just um, walk you through a little bit of things, and then we'll get to the to the uh, to the uh, questions of intermetallic information. So, the, uh, as I said, the idea is to start from elementary interactions and conservation laws, and uh, by via uh, simulations to get to physical properties observables, and uh, ideally to uh, uh, some guidelines for the design of better materials. The uh, spatial scales, as I say, you can, uh, the computer does know that you are going to input the data about the star. You can study stars and galaxies in the universe up to atoms and electrons on temporal scales of millions of years and over 10 per second. And here's an example of... Uh, so uh, uh, I will uh, switch to another uh, part of it. And uh, uh, this is um, directly to, uh, to the question of the uh, intermetallic contacts. So, the uh, question of intermetallic contacts that, uh, uh, it has to do with the question of adhesion between two, uh, two, uh, two metals, a tip and a substrate. And uh, as, um, as uh, was uh, shown today by Dawson, uh, uh, already in, uh, in the 1700s, uh, people have started to uh, measure these things. This is actually the, uh, the 1699 version of the atomic force microscope. As a matter of fact, that's a multi atomic force microscope. The physical view letters version of that appeared in 1986. And uh, in principle, the same idea. You have a uh, cantilever. This is this uh, uh, thing over there cantilever and you have uh, the tip and you have a surface and you're going to bring the tip against the surface and measure the force by the reflection of the cantilever. And we will try to simulate that. However, one thing that should be kept in mind is that in the normal uh, way of doing these experiments, what you're measuring is the instability or the reflection of the cantilevers that carry the, the, uh, the, uh, the tip. This has been mentioned during today. Uh, in, in our simulations, what we were we looking is the material response itself, nothing to do with the cantilever. We are looking how the atoms stretch, how things are. I'll forget that I have enough material. So uh, the uh, the atomic uh, force microscope is a good uh, is, is, a, is, is a device that allows one to uh, to uh, to measure things on a very very fine scale with the resolution and forces of 10 minus 10 newtons. Uh, uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a it, study really things on the nano scale. So now, if we have the elastic material, and uh, such as, for example, graphite or some asteroid, this is data by Bernard and Copeland at the time of the NRL, and you get this uh, non-hysteresis type of behavior. This is ideally uh, elastic behavior. You push in, namely penetration depth versus load. You increase the load, you penetrate, and you depenetrate, so to speak, and you get uh, this elastic behavior. On the other hand, if you do such an experiment in gold and you then to 100 nanometers, it did, but I believe this was maybe tungsten. Yeah, and you get uh, totally uh, inelastic behavior. And um, in uh, the cases that I'll show you, you see, so, so this is complete uh, idea of the reason, this is not the reason. And uh, the question is what happens if you take uh, uh, two different types of metals, and that's what we have done. I could have shown you some slides having to do with graphite, but you won't see them today. And uh, what, uh, what I will show you is uh, things having to do with, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, this particular couple of nickel and gold. So you will see the results here shown on, the, on, the, uh, on this thing if it works. And, uh, but let me tell you, um, uh, just motivate you uh, uh, what to look at. This is the uh, force in the z direction in nanonewtons on a nickel tip. It's a function of distance between the tip and the surface. Now the distance here is in units of Armstrong's, and it's, uh, it's a peculiar choice of an axis. This is the distance away from the point of contact. Okay, so it's one has away from the point of contact. Let me just tell you, and you'll see it in the video, that for example, the distance between the two opposing surfaces, bottom of the tip 
half of the surface, and the point C here, and the jump to contact is about 4.2 miles. So you would all motivated if you look at the right numbers. So what you see is you come from very far uh, from the surface. There's uh, uh, almost no force between the liquid and the gold substrate. As you come closer, minus for me means attractive force. You uh, start to feel the interaction between the two. This is all using the man body better than potentials. And at this point here, there's an instability. And the attraction just uh, zooms down and you get the uh, uh, minus 40 nanometers in this particular we didn't normalize the radius of the data to do force by the radius and then uh, directly larger and the uh, scale this way. Now if I now uh, bring lift it, it retract it back on the surface, I follow the red curve uh, here. You see this is the hysteresis in the force curve. And uh, of course this was also uh, such hysteresis uh, with, uh, with uh, different uh, scales of dips and substrates, but uh, here's the experimental result of the cantilever deflection on the force constant translated to a force, and you see the approach and, and the reasons I'm going back that we take and go. Uh, so now with, um, with uh, this little bit, let me uh, um, uh, turn to that with some work of uh, prevention and prayer, and um, we'll see if this works. If I can have the lights out, this I'm sure will work this way. And, um, so now, uh, this is, is that what I need to do, Jonathan? Uh, just push play.